Federal Conservative leader Pierre Polyev wants to axe the carbon tax. But axing it will not make a difference in terms of the amount of taxes you pay, even though, listen, asterisk, I am 100% against a carbon tax. I don't think that it's relevant. I don't think it's necessary. And I'm just against the idea of giving the government more money to fight climate change. Our revenue statistics are real, okay? The tax to GDP ratio, the tax that the government collects versus what we produce as a country has remained consistent for the past 20 years. OECD did a study and it found that relative to other countries, we're pretty much right there. But also from 2000 to 2022, our range of tax to GDP ratio has hovered between 33 and 34% of our GDP. That's no difference. And that's during a time where we had liberal majorities, conservative majorities, liberal minorities, conservative minorities. All this to say that our taxation as a whole doesn't change liberal to conservative. Okay, so if we scroll down, the structure of our tax and the way in which the government collects it, the majority, 36% of total tax revenues, personal income, profits, and gains. Followed by 14% to social security, 13% on corporate income, 13% on goods and services, 11% on taxes and property, uh, you know, and payroll taxes and other very small amounts. But 36% is on personal income, profits, and gains. I don't want to say this because guaranteeing means there's a, a, a guarantee and there is no guarantee to anything, but I don't think any politician would ever campaign on, I'm going to dramatically reduce your personal income. It's the largest expense you have as an employed Canadian. The largest expense you have every year is your personal income, profits and gains. Period, period, period. And that hasn't changed year over year. In fact, uh, OECD looked at our tax revenue from 1956 to now, and our total tax revenue has gone from 15,318, it's, it's an annotated uh, uh, spreadsheet, um, up to 924,914. Again, these are annotated numbers, but you can see our tax revenue over a 50 year period has gone up far more than our population increase over that same period of time. So that tells us that government is in the business of increasing its tax revenue. That's its business. So you might be asking yourself, why? And I'll get to that in a second. But for those that believe in the carbon tax, the general, salute, the general idea is where people just lose it. The idea that I need to give the government more money to fight global climate change makes no sense. Now, some people might say, well, if you put a price on pollution, people might second guess very carbon intensive activities. I don't know that to be true. I don't think people change their behavior based on a price of, on pollution. Now, hear me out. Very intense industries that burn a lot of fossil fuels like cement, oil and gas, etc. They can't exactly shift to a much more environmentally friendly way of getting those uh, uh, natural resources out without burning a ton of fossil fuels along the way. You might be asking, do consumers on a day-to-day -day basis make a change? Again, I don't know that to be true. I don't think any of us on our day-to-day in our day-to-day -day lives are actively looking to drastically change our behavior in the name of climate change, right? So if you live five kilometers away from work, yeah, you might bike, not necessarily because it helps the environment, maybe it's just more efficient. But if you live 20 kilometers away, you're not biking, you're not cycling, you're not walking. People might be making decisions on purchasing a vehicle for sure, but I don't know how much that has to do with the environment than it does with just how much it costs. I think cost is a bigger driver of consumer uh, goods than, than the environment or thinking of the environment. Okay, so I think that's the criticism of the, of the carbon tax. It doesn't really make sense to give governments more money. 
to fight a global climate change, especially when you think about the fact that Canada's not going to be more immune to climate change, even if we have the most stringent carbon tax, right? Like, our government's not going to protect our country from climate change if we give them more money through carbon taxes. So that's another thing I think more people should use in their lexicon and make sure it's A ton of elections, but I'm not young enough to think this is my first rodeo. I know that government, it doesn't matter what stripe, has business to do. There are roads and bridges that need to be fixed. We have a healthcare system, education spending, there's border security, there's national defense, there's all types of things. First Nations, Metis, and Inuit will continue to assert land claims and traditional, sorry, and land rights and traditional territorial rights. Those are government business. That those are government business, period. And it doesn't care about what stripe you are. So what happens is governments, politicians come in and say, we're going to streamline the bureaucracy. We're going to put a hiring freeze on. We're not going to expand the bureaucracy. And what happens usually as a result of that is consultants get hired, work, business gets farmed out to other, to other uh, businesses to do, and a lot of money is being spent on consultants to do the work of bureaucrats. Now, one may argue that, well, it's better to pay a consultant, they'll do it on time, they'll do it efficiently, and there's a price incentive, and it's much more... Uh, it's much more financially uh, cost effective to hire a consultant for a couple of years or a year to do the work of an entire branch or unit within government. Okay, like we could, I could see that per point, but let's think about government for a second, just the election cycle, right? So the new government gets elected. The first year is about cleaning up the previous government's mess as they would like to characterize it. The second year is starting to understand the fact that they're in the business of government business, right? Their, their ministers, etc., start understanding that, oh man, like being the minister means that I'm in charge of a lot of business, legislation, regulation, you know, your parks regulation. If you're in parks, fine, if, sorry, if you're in uh, transportation, there's regulation on our roads, our highways. Those need to be updated. Uh, stakeholder groups are always looking out to see how they can assert their power in those negotiations. Um, the, if you're in Indigenous Affairs, there's always uh, communities and organizations coming to you about you know, government action on their traditional territory. Um, there's all types of litigation and legal lawsuits that the government are, is fighting or is, is trying to negotiate. If you're the Minister in Indigenous Affairs, you have to think about that. That's part of your day-to-day. Finance, geez, you're always thinking about tax revenue and in some cases how to expand that. Uh, you know, if you're the president of the Treasury Board, you're looking at efficiencies within the bureaucracy. And then, of course, you've got the Auditor General who's trying to make sure you're spending money in a very efficient way, an effective way. And I haven't even mentioned lobby groups that see you as the prime minister, the minister, etc., and they're vying for your attention. So that is a very, like, scratching the surface of government business. It doesn't matter what stripe you are, you're getting into government, and that's the environment in which you're working in. So you farm these things out to consultants. Year two, year three, you're starting to understand how business works, and guess what happens in year three? You're starting to think about re-election because you made a lot of promises. You promised to slash the bureaucracy. You promised to reduce taxes. Well, guess what? The bureaucracy hasn't really been cut because you realized how much business needs to be done. And taxation hasn't gone down because as we've seen, taxation keeps going up. So what happens? 
then you run in four years on a platform that looks very similar to the previous government. Very eerily similar. And suddenly the opposition, they say, well, guess what? Christopher ran on all these things and that he did not hesitate to criticize us. Well, guess what? Christopher got into office. And what happened when Christopher got into office? Well, turns out, oh, how the tides, turntables have turned. Christopher in office is no different than us. So why spend your time listening to a liar when you could just elect us again? And suddenly you, Christopher, have to defend this what would otherwise be considered mediocre record. On top of which, you're going out to communities and cities and cultural groups and stakeholder groups and not-for-profit groups, and you said you would reduce their taxes. And instead, they look at their pay stub every month, every week, other week, and they say to themselves, where's the tax relief? I thought my cost of living was supposed to be relieved. But it hasn't. And the reason why is because government business marches on. Think about it like this. It's my final point. Government business is like an arena with a sports game. Let's take basketball, right? At the end of the day, you can have different players like a Kobe Bryant and a LeBron James, but the court, the rules, the net, the distance between both nets, the distance between the net and the free throw line and center court doesn't change. You can have different teams and different stripes, but the rules of the game don't change. Think of that when it comes to government business. The rules of government business generally don't change. Unless uh, a very big event happens, these don't change. And so I just want to quell people's ideas that removing a carbon tax or anything else, which, by the way, I'm against the carbon tax. Let me just reiterate that once more. It's not going to change government business. 